So at the beginning of the semester, I said we were going to write a paper in slow motion. And we wrote a summary paper, you guys wrote a synthesis paper, and finally here at the end you're writing a research paper, a bona fide research paper. And uh, in every one of those instances, we ran through a few of the aspects of the writing process, talking about planning, gathering of ideas, determining focus. In fact, we did that twice um, in the, the recorded material. So if you've been following this on YouTube and you're not one of my students, just know there was other content. You just didn't see it. Um, but uh, we also talked about shaping. How do we organize our material? How do we make sure that it coheres? They say, I say, chapter eight. Coherence is super important. So shaping and planning for coherence is really important. And then last week we talked about drafting, writing our ideas into sentences and paragraphs, uh, something that could be boiled down to saying, you know, this is not when you write brilliant prose. This is when you just get the concepts down on the page and you do the editing and the revision later on. Now, when I first started teaching the writing process, it was out of a textbook and the final three steps were some form of revision. It was like editing and proofreading and then revision. And I just put it all under the umbrella of revision, um, where we evaluate our grammar, our ideas, our evidence. And if you shut this off right now, just before you go, I want to tell you the best thing you can do during the revision process is read your work out loud to hear errors, your eye doesn't see that we our eye you know the, the the information that goes into our brain via our eye is often translated in the pattern recognition machine as complete when it's not because we know what we mean to say we fill in the gaps as we read silently but when we read out loud we we hear things that we don't see as problems when we're revising. So if you do nothing else for the revision process, read your work out loud to yourself and you're going to see some of the problems that your eye wouldn't catch. I'm going to quote here from a, a book that I use in my film courses, writing about movies. Um, and uh, it's uh, mostly written by Karen Goxick. Uh, Dave Monahan and Richard Barsom are mentioned there, but they're, they're the guys who are talking about film. And Goxick says, professional writers know that to write is to rewrite. This is another way of saying uh, what one of my books that, that I own, uh, it says, uh, to write is to revise. <laughs> the book is called Revision, so go figure. But to write is to revise. When we write, when we craft, when we create, we need to assume that our first draft isn't going to be our best. Okay, And so we take some time, we give ourselves time, to come back to our text with hopefully fresh eyes. And this is something that um, I've read in a few different places. Uh, you need to step away from your work long enough before you revise that to some degree you sort of forget what you said or what you didn't say. Stephen King says that he takes a month away from his book. I think it's a month. Maybe it's longer. But you don't have a month if you're in university. You don't have a month if you're writing uh, under duress with a due date, right? So how much time do you have? And divide whatever that time is up into the four components of the writing process. And you will have given yourself time for revision. But in between drafting and revision, try and, try and put a break in there. And if you can't give yourself a long temporal break, walk away from where you're writing, your computer, the, the notepad, whatever it might be. Go for a walk. Get away from your work. If you can give yourself a weekend, that's a really great situation because the weekend's going to be filled with other stuff. You're not going to be working on that paper anymore. Maybe you're going to work on a bunch of other stuff for work or school or whatever it might be. And then you come back to that work and you'll see it with fresh eyes. The reading out loud to yourself creates a certain level of freshness that, you know, the ear hears what the eye can't catch. Um, but when we take time away, we really give ourselves the optimal situation to be able to rewrite well because we're seeing it with fresh eyes. When I go back to look at stuff that I wrote months, years ago, I'm like, wow, 
In some cases, I'm like, God, who, who let me publish that? In other cases, I get to go, oh, that was smart. I'm glad. To, oh, I said that because I'll be like, that is smart. He's saying smart things. And I'll be like, oh, that was me. Um, and and we, you, you'll probably do the same thing, too, as you go through your degree. You'll come across stuff that you wrote a few years ago and you go, wow, that, that was well done. Or, oh, my gosh, I really was in first year. Um here I'm, 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 I've got a list of questions that Karen Goxick asks the reader of writing about movies. And by the way, I think writing about movies is one of the best writing books I've read. I mean, it's a nice little primer on film analysis as well, but for sheer concision of concept, Goxick does such a wonderful job of going, here's how you write a paper. And in the section on revision includes the same sort of list of questions that we find in They Say, I Say. Questions like, if you're writing a research paper, does the introduction place your argument in the ongoing conversation? So here we hear Goxick saying some of the same things that Graf and Birkenstein do in They Say, I Say. And what I hope you know we've learned at this point in the semester is that if we have multiple sources that say a thing, hmm, we, we probably want to wanna pay attention to what they have to say. Um, if you're writing a research paper, does the introduction place your argument in the ongoing conversation? Or is it just a fanciful introduction? Some students think like, I have introduced it with flair and moxie, and aren't you interested now? And it's like, yes, but none of this is relevant. It's like I heard uh, a speech given by the, um, he was my boss. I'm just going to say that. I don't want to get any more particular than that. He was my boss, and he was the boss of hundreds of people. He was my many steps up boss. And he had to give a speech at a luncheon and he opened up with a joke and it was funny and it was awesome. And I'm like, I can't wait to see where this goes. And then the next thing he did had nothing to do with the speech he was giving. It was just, he'd heard somewhere like, if you're going to speak to people, tell a joke at the beginning. Yeah, tell a relevant joke. Tell a joke that gets us all into the argument that you're about to make. Does the introduction place your argument in the ongoing conversation? Do you demonstrate that you are, you know, all the content is relevant, but also that you're coming into that conversation with other sources? Does the thesis make a point worth considering? Some people will be like, I have a thesis. It's like, yes, the, the thesis is that the sky is blue. That is not controversial, right? Does it answer the question, so what? This is coxic. This isn't they say, I say, but this is all they say, I say language, right? Does the paper deliver what your thesis promises, promises to deliver? Because you go to revise, you're not just editing for comma splices and misused semicolons. You're revising to see whether or not you have an argument in the first place. Is it any good? Does it cohere? Does it flow? Is there a point to this? Have you inflated, I love this one, have you inflated the language in order to pad a conclusion that is empty and ineffective? Oh, we've all done this, right? Inflate the language, like I use lots of really large words, and it will obscure the fact that I have no clue how to conclude this essay, And at which point I refer you back to my video on introductions and conclusions, because that will help you. Chapter 11 of They Say, I Say does the same thing as, as Goxick does in writing about movies. And I think, uh, you know, I've seen this in other books as well, but I think it's a really great way. It's a wonderful checklist, really great way of having a um, list that we can go to rather than just sort of nebulously knowing that we need to revise. It's great to have a list checklist that we can go, did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? And so, you know, if you're, if you're watching this or listening to this and you are not part of my class, maybe you want to pick up Karen Goxick's writing about movies, or maybe you want to pick up a copy of They Say, I Say. Get anything from the third, fourth, or fifth edition with They Say, I Say, and you're going to get this revision checklist, and it is worth having it. Those of you who are my students, hang on to They Say, I Say, and refer back to this checklist when you write papers for other courses. We're just going to take a look at some of the questions. We're not going to look at all of them, the ones that are most relevant to our course. How do you represent what they say, right? One of the big concepts of our semester, they say, and then I get to talk about what I say, right? Not... I say, and then they get a turn, but rather they say, and then I say. 
So do you start with what others say? And again, we're back to the planning stage. How can you start with what others say if you don't go get sources, read them, and then master their content well enough to be able to use it in your, in your essays? Um, I've mentioned this before, uh, but I've had students who told me that the way their, their writing process was that they write the paper, then they go and find sources to support what they've said. They write the paper, then they go try and find sources that, 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 that support what they said. That's like deciding that you're going to find a particular item of clothing, but you don't do any research in advance to see if your shopping trip will actually get you where that clothing piece might be or whether or not that garment even exists, right? So you go shopping for, I don't know, uh, a Godzilla onesie. <laughs> I don't know if this exists. Now I'm curious. Um, when you're going from store to store and you just can't find a Godzilla onesie and you're like, what the hell, world? Why is there no Godzilla onesie for me? I had decided I needed a Godzilla onesie. Where is it? That's a lot like writing a paper and then going to your library database and saying, hey, library database, please cough up the articles I need to support my wacky theories. And students will come to me and say, I can't find any sources. Then you shouldn't have written on that thesis because you, for a research paper in university, you need evidence. Okay. Do you summarize or paraphrase what they've said? Because if all you do is quote, you're not demonstrating that you've mastered that content, right? Summary and paraphrase demonstrate greater mastery than just a quotation will, but you can show greater mastery if you frame your quotations, right? Do you quote others? You should quote others. It's not that I'm saying you should never quote. You should. And that's part of shaping. The quoting, the summarizing, summarizing, the paraphrasing, we're taking their ideas and we're saying, okay, what order do these need to go in? Do you remind readers of what others say at various points throughout your text? Or do you do the thing that so many of my students have over the years? They go like, oh, I need three secondary sources. So they start their paper and they're like, here's the introduction. And I quoted one of my secondary sources in there. And then in the second paragraph, they're like, and here's two more quotes. And one is from the other source and here's the third. And now I'm out of here. And, and they just go on whatever it is that they want to say. R rather than having any sort of conversation with sources. Well, for a research paper, that's garbage. That's just an opinion piece. That's an op-ed. That's an editorial. But it's not a research paper. A research paper begins with what others say, it responds to what others say, and it engages them throughout the text. It doesn't just depart from them. What do you say should come second? We learn what they say first, then we respond. And this fills our mental tank. So it's not a bad approach. It's a good approach. It's, it's the approach that gets us there. So many students run into writer's block because they don't have any more ideas because they're, they're working on stuff that they, this is not, they're, you're not an expert on this information most of the time. And even when you're an expert, I can tell you, I'm an expert in some of the fields. Most, most of my writing is in my area of expertise. And I always find it easier to write when I respond to others, when I come into conversation with others. So what do you say? Do you agree, disagree, or both with those you're responding to? S see where you sit, as Graf and Birkenstein say, see where you sit relative to other people's claims. If you disagree, do you give reasons for that disagreement? Or do you just go, no, right? Um, no. And if you agree, have you added to the conversation? In other words, are you expanding upon this at all? Because if you aren't, number one, you're just hurting yourself for getting to your word count. And number two, you're hurting your reader because they don't understand why you think what you think. Right? So we always have to remember there's a reader on the other end. And some of these prompts force us to consider that. If both, like this one, have you done so without confusing readers? If you say, okay, but, if you say yes and no, if you say, okay, but, have you done so without confusing your reader? You just said yes, now you said no, and you told you didn't give me reasons, and now I'm confused. Or are you just being evasive? You know, you pick the ending. No, it's not a, it's not a research essay. A conclusion should never be, you choose. Um, 
Have you stated your position in the one it responds to as a connected unit? Are you connecting the dots? Are you putting it all together? What reasons and evidence do you offer as support for what you say? You have to show your work. In English, as, as, as in mathematics, mathematics are like, please show your work. And I'm regularly saying to my students, please show your work. Have you tied it all together? Have you tied it all together? Because you can have the best information on the page, but if it's not organized in a way that coheres, it's not forceful, it's not convincing, and it's not going to get an A. So if your big goal is good grades, then just having all the information in the page isn't enough. Can readers follow your argument from one sentence and paragraph to, to the next and see how each successive point supports your overall argument? Is there a journey that you are taking your reader on? Are you guiding them through the shifts? Think of yourself as a guide in a museum exhibit. Are you guiding your reader through the argument? Are you making huge logic leaps? One moment you're talking about Greek government, the next you're talking about Greek food, right? How do those things cohere? They don't. Check your use of transitions, words like however and therefore. Do they actually do what you think they do? They say, I say, has a wonderful chapter filled with words that do these things, these transition terms. But if you don't stop to consider whether or not that's the best transition term, you might as well put the transition terms on a dartboard, throw darts at it, choose those. That's about as good as just going, well, I think it's supposed to be therefore at this point, but you're not really stopping to consider what therefore is therefore. Check your use of pointing words such as this and that. Pronouns need to be close to their antecedents or they will not point to them. But if you say this or that, you could get with this or you could get with that. Or you could go with this or you could get with that. I never knew what those guys were talking about because I wasn't really paying attention earlier. So what is this and what is that? It's an old rap song. Have you used repetition with a difference, right? That we repeat ourselves could be problematic if we're just being repetitious. But if we repeat ourselves with a difference, then there's coherence. The, the essay has a flow to it. Over and over again, we're being given the same, you know, words, key terms and phrases. Holds the whole thing together. Keeps it, keeps it together. Have you all shown, and this is, the, this is the thing at the end, have you shown why your argument matters? Don't assume that your readers will see why your argument is important or why they should care. Be sure you have told them why. And remember that this is not the moment that we're trying to cure cancer or end war or do anything grand and lofty. People can care about what you're saying because they work in the discipline that you're writing about. In our course, I mean, we're writing, some of you are writing about Godzilla. Why does this matter? It matters to people who do, do, who do film studies. It matters to people who like giant monster movies. It matters potentially to anyone who saw Godzilla vs. Kong this last year and might have wondered to themselves, what's the staying power of this character? Why are we still watching movies about a giant lizard? That's weird, right? Um, maybe it's just that secret history moment. Would you like me to tell you something you didn't know? about something silly you thought Godzilla was silly but actually turned out to be serious or you thought that it was all America's fault for dropping the atomic bomb but and and maybe that doesn't matter within the 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 strict context of like you know that's already happened we can't do anything about it no it's absolutely true but we learn from history don't we and some of my students every year they see, they, they, they part the veil and they go, oh, truth is complicated. Yeah, that's really the point of this course, right? That what we see on the surface, what we know about a thing might have other uh, facets to it. And we want to know those other facets and we want to get the best information about it so that we can form the best opinions really at the end of the day because unless we're working with mathematics or physics sometimes it's up for grabs right 
But when we find the best information, we learn well. And we want to give that information to our reader in the best form possible. You want to put your best foot forward with your writing. And maybe it's not the writing for this course, but maybe it's the writing for a cover letter. And maybe you should stop to consider how you could take some of the concepts that we've learned in this class and write a really great cover letter. That you research the company that you're hoping to apply to. That you consider what they were asking for in the job ad. What did they say they wanted? And then you can reply, I'm it. And you support that with evidence. I have done this before. I am well versed in the arts of whatever it is that you're going to be doing if you get this job. Introducing this cover letter in a way that grabs the reader's attention. Oh my gosh, the number of really boring openings that I've read in cover letters. And then wrapping it up in a way that brings closure. I read something with style and I want to get on the phone and say, come on in for that job interview, unless the job interview is just for flipping burgers and then maybe it doesn't matter as much. But for the jobs that you might be seeking once you are done at McEwen, you want to have that really strong cover letter. So writing a one-off cover letter that's going to apply to every job, no, 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 no. Every time you write that cover letter, you're making an argument that says, hire me, hire me. And don't hire any, any of the other people who have applied. So we can take that information. We can plan. We can shape. We can draft. And please, please, please revise to give yourself uh, the best work possible, to hand in the best version of the, uh, the, the writing that you've been doing. If you're going to invest all that time in the planning, the shaping, and the drafting, make sure that you invest the time in the revision.